you are making the world a better place by listening to the Joy of Living podcast. This is your guide to achieving a more purposeful, powerful, and positive life. Join Barry Shore in unlocking the best version of you and becoming happier, healthier, and wealthier. And now, here's your ambassador of joy, Barry Shore. Good day, beautiful, bountiful, beloved, immortal beings, and good-looking people. Remember, you're good-looking, which you're always looking for and finding the good. You found good in abundance. You have decided to use your most valuable asset, your time, to tune into the joy of living with your humble host, Barry Shore. And you tuned in for one reason and one reason only. It's the best reason in the whole world, because you care the most in the entire world about you. Y-O-U. And that's great because when you become the best you, you make the world a better place. You build more bridges of harmony. You create more joy, happiness, peace, and love in the world. And today you are about to be hearing from one of the more dynamic, interesting, powerful voices of reason and sanity in the world, Rabbi Dole Fisher will be with us in just a few minutes. But right now, we want to talk about why you tuned in. Because you know on this show, we discuss the three fundamentals of life. And when you work with these three fundamentals of life, the result is you will be happier, healthier, and wealthier. Who doesn't want that? Now, of course, the three fundamentals of life are, number one, life, your life has purpose. When you lead a purpose-driven life, number two happens. Now, in this case, a good number two, you go MAD. Now, MAD is a wonderful acronym that stands for make a difference. You lead a purpose-driven life, you make a difference in the world. And the third fundamental is to uncover the power and the secrets of everyday words and terms. Simple example, WWW. Ask anybody what does WWW stand for? Invariably, it's to do with the internet. Now, factually speaking, they're correct. But in our world, the world of the positive, purposeful, powerful, and pleasant, WWW stands for what a wonderful world. And it is. <laughs> you know, imagine right now you are being joined by more than 348,000 people around the world, all tuning in for one reason to become the best you possible and to unite together to bring about more joy, happiness, peace, and love in the world. Now, and whenever you hear the words, opening uh, bars of the song, what a wonderful world, what do you do right away? You can't help it, you smile. Now, smile is one of the most important words you'll ever internalize, utilize, and leverage in your life because smile is a great acronym that stands for seeing miracles in life every day. That's right. Now, I am privileged to tell you that not only do I do webinars or people around the world listen, but I do in-person situations. Recently, I did a talk. We have uh, 1,172 people in the audience. And I'm telling the story about Barry Shore and Upbeat and people are hugging and the energy is great. And I'm talking about seeing miracles in life every day. And people, some people raise their hand and say, hey, Barry Shore, Barry Shore, I've been up for hours. Right? I haven't seen any miracles. And I asked them, are you here? Can you hear? Can you stand still? I can't do that. Can you walk? I can barely do that. You have water to drink, you have food to eat, you have a place to sleep, you have family, you have friends. Every single one of those is a miracle. And what's the proof? Simplest proof. A million people didn't get out of bed this morning. You know why? They died. By definition, if you're watching or listening, you didn't. Therefore, you have an obligation to live life to the full to be able to bring about more benefit into the world. Now, I'm just going to tell you a quick story. It's a story about me. Imagine if you can, standing up in the morning, completely healthy and hearty, able to lead tall buildings in a single bound, and that evening being in the hospital totally, completely paralyzed from the neck down. And it was not an automobile accident. It was not a spinal injury. It was a rare disease, which I never heard of the day before. It took over my body and rendered me what's called a quadriplegic. It means nothing in my body moved my neck down. I can only communicate by blinking my eyes. I was 144 days in the hospital. 
I was in a hospital bed in my own home for two years. I couldn't turn over by myself. I was in a wheelchair for four years. I had braces on my legs, my hips to my ankles. That was progress. Thank God today I'm able to be vertical and ambulatory with the help of a seven-foot walking wand. So I'm a tripod, not a biped. I still can't walk up a stair by myself. I can't walk up a curb by myself. I help 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But you hear my voice. Positive, purposeful, powerful, and pleasant, all because of one word. Smile. Seeing miracles in life every day. But I got to tell you a quick story. My eight-year-old niece comes over to me a few weeks ago. She says, Uncle Barry, Uncle Barry, can we spell smile, S-M-I-E-L? I thought about it. Smile, smile, sounds the same. Why not? I asked her, how come? She says, because then it would stand for seeing miracles in everyday life. Out of the mouth of an eight-year-old. But what was she doing? She was creating the kind of world that she wants to live in. Now, CREATE is a fabulous acronym that stands for Causing, Rethinking, Enabling All to Excel. Rethinking is the key. We call it a shift in perspective. Now, i got to tell you, I've been working with people for more than 42 years. And 97.2% of all the people I begin to work with, for some reason, drop the F in shift and the other stuff happens. You have to be careful with your F. You want to shift your perspective just a little bit. And then you'll be able to internalize, utilize, and leverage the six most important words you'll ever learn. And they are choice, not chance, determines your destiny. How you choose to respond in any given situation will help determine your pathway and the trajectory of your life. Now, before we bring on Rabbi Dole Fisher, I want to warn him and a lot of the people listening, because we have, thank God, you're always bringing families and friends. By the time we have Rabbi Fisher on, we'll have over 369,000, maybe 370,000 people. I want to warn everybody, I do use a lot of four-letter words. I even use the four-letter F-U word because of the shock value, and it's fun. Now, of course, the four-letter words that we use, because we live in the world of the positive, purposeful, powerful, and pleasant, are love, life, hope, free, gift, play, pray, swim. And the four-letter F-U word is fun. Fun. That's right. F-U, capital N, capital N. Now, right away, some people raise their hands and say, hey, Barry Shaw, fun's only spelled with three letters. Not in our world. The world of the positive, purposeful, powerful, and planet is spelled F-U, capital N, capital N. So after the show, you see a family and friends. I want you to point your finger, have a smile on your face, a twinkle in your eye, and say, F-U, everybody. But add right away, capital N, capital N. You'll get their attention. Say, where'd you get that? So I listened to Barry Shaw on the joy of living, and he had an amazing Rabbi Dole Fisher, and you, but this is what they're talking about. You need to grab people's attention before you can even begin to speak with them. So before we bring on Rabbi Fisher, I want to urge everybody to do the following. I want you to use the two most powerful words in English language three times a day from now and the rest of your life. And the reason is because it will make you happier, healthier, and wealthier. Imagine the following. You walk into your fancy coffee shop and you order a latte. You sit down. Somebody brings it to you. You say thank you, of course. You walk in the coffee shop. You order a fancy latte. You sit down. Nobody brings it. You go to the counter and they say, I'm sorry, we forgot. We'll bring it. You sit down. A couple of minutes go by. Somebody brings it. You still say thank you. You walk in the coffee shop and it's raining out. Somebody, <laughs> somebody holds the door open for you. You say thank you. You're in the coffee shop. You're walking out and it's raining out. Somebody slams the door on you. You say, thank you. You're in traffic. You're late for an appointment. Somebody cuts you off. You say, thank you. Thank stands for to harmonize and nurture kindness. Imagine you get up in the middle of the night and you stub your toe and it hurts. You say, thank you. To harmonize and nurture kindness. Kind is a wondrous word that stands for keep inspiring noble deeds. I can't think of anybody, anybody right now that I can share with you that inspires noble deeds more than wonderful Rabbi Doe Fisher. Rabbi Fisher, please say hello to 369,822 people around the world. Hello, 369,822 people around the world. <laughs> you see why I asked him, Kwan? Because he's smart, he's articulate, he's capable. If you're watching, you see that great smile on his face, and he listens. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share with everybody a couple of things, because if I start telling you everything about Rabbi Fisher, it will take the rest of the hour, so I won't. I will suffice to give you three data points. Number one, 
His first name is not rabbi. That's his position in life. That's that's his avocation, maybe even his vocation. Uh, and he's the rabbi of a wonderful congregation in Orange County, California. Number two, uh, to his great credit, he's also a not just a biblical scholar, but he's a legal scholar and a very successful attorney, uh, having run worked for many companies and, and adjudicated several interesting cases and clerked for some major people. He is a basic, what we call a Jewish overachiever. And in addition to that, He's an author, and I mean a prolific, you know, I don't know how you say author without prolific, but he is a prolific author whose essays and whose books are intriguing, interesting, and captivating, and that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, he does it with almost with ease, even though you know that it takes a lot of work to do that. So he has insights into what is happening right now at this very critical point point in history. I didn't say Jewish history. In history, because as go the Jews, so goes the world. I'm making that statement. You don't have to agree with me, Robbie Fisher. But as an introduction, I'm just going to jump right in and ask you a, um, an intriguing question. And that is, based on where you are sitting in Orange County, California, as a devoted Jew, head of a congregation, and see, and writing a book called Jews for Nothing, which is a very intriguing title, and you'll talk about it later. What do you see happening right now for Jews in the United States? And then we'll switch to Israel. Jews in the United States right now are in a very extraordinary time in their history, our history, because it's never been better, and it's uh, never been more challenging in certain ways. Jews have reached a point where we have full opportunity uh, to reach any kind of level we want. Historically, throughout the world, and even in the United States, many areas of uh, employment were closed to Jews. Uh, historically, in America, we could not work in certain law firms as attorneys unless we agreed to do bankruptcy law which the law firms found to be very uh, untasteful, but ne necessary. So they didn't want to touch bankruptcy and bankruptcy law, let the Jews do that, but no other law. So we could not get into many major law firms. Uh, many hospitals did not give admission privileges to Jewish doctors. That was one of the first reasons Jews had to build their own hospitals like Cedars sinai in Los Angeles and Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and others. Nowadays, you can get into any law firm, you can get into any hospital to practice. Uh, we have enormous opportunities that never existed before. Many people are incredibly nice. We, we saw Joe Lieberman, an Orthodox Jew, ran for vice president of the United States. Um, the last president, Trump, had... Uh, has a daughter who's an Orthodox Jew, observes the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the way an Orthodox Jew would. And uh, so we've never had it better in certain ways. The Biden family, several of them are married to Jews. Uh, Jews have never had so much access to opportunity. But at the same time, there have been outbreaks and eruptions of anti-Semitism at the college campuses and the universities. And uh, it's a source of concern because Things that happen on the universities now, typically, those are the people who in 10 or 20 years will be running the United States. Those are the future leaders. And if anti-Semitism is brewing in their environment, that's what they're going to turn, that's what America might, God forbid, turn out to be. So there's a lot of concern. So it goes both ways, Barry, because I have to tell you that in terms of my own life here in Orange County, I experienced a great amount of, 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 of good. Uh, what you would say is joy, uh, because I'll give you an example. Um, I needed to renew my driver's license every five years. You have to update, renew your driver's license. I was at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, to renew my license. I was online. 
uh, to get the picture after you go through all the different steps. They finally tell you go to, let's say, line 13 or 12, uh, and they'll take your picture. So it's a slow line. I'm standing on line or in line, and right behind me, and I wear a yarmulke, and right behind me, the lady says, excuse me, yes, are you Jewish? And she's trying to start the conversation. Obviously, I am. She sees the yarmulke. Are you Jewish? Yes. I bless your people. I bless Israel every day. She said, I wasn't thinking of this. I'm thinking of my, my driver's license. And from out of nowhere, I bless you as a Jew. I bless the Jewish people. In my church, we bless the Jewish people, and we pray for your people, and we pray for us. I mean, you don't read about that in the newspapers, but that also goes on in America, where Christians come up to me, and they, they tell me they bless the Jews, and they bless Israel. And then, of course, there are other Christians that don't have that viewpoint. But it's it's a mixed bag. But life in America still is good for Jews. So I want to unpack a number of things that you mentioned here, because I, I think most people around the world, and certainly this audience, this audience is primarily under the age of 32. And most everybody is in the United States, but uh, again, around the world and have no idea because when they hear about a, a Jewish attorney or a Jewish doctor, it's almost like an oxymoron. Well, of course, <laughs> but I know when I was growing up because I'm of age, I'm 75 chronologically, uh, Jewish lawyers were, yes, there were more and more happening, but it was still a, as you said, a narrow field. A matter of fact, as a data point, as you know better than almost anybody, Jews actually wrote most of the bankruptcy laws in the United States of America, the codes. Uh, we were also weren't, al not allowed, but there weren't a lot of banks that would recognize Jews or give loans to Jews. So what did Jews do? We started our own banks. As an example, a very famous one in uh, Los Angeles area, City National Bank, you know, grew to great prominence. Uh, the same thing as you mentioned with hospitals and such like that. Uh, let's shift to what you say about college campuses today. And I'm going to make a statement, and it's actually a question and a statement. And I think that a lot of the uh, the grabbing of headlines today on college campuses and the, uh, the, the I don't want to call pro-Palestinian because it's not, this idea of pro-Hamas even uh, is born out of something that we have witnessed as Jews for generations upon generations, wherever we were. And it's called the E word, envy. In other words, Jews have been so successful. I mean, so successful in every walk of life that envy is something, as we know from the book of Proverbs, that envy is the rot of bones. It literally gets inside of the human being and it eats away. And it, one of the ways you lash out at others because of envy is by doing things that are radically upsetting. So I'm not saying that everybody is like that who's now protesting, but I, I am I am of the opinion that the protests are a, a veneer, a thin veneer. Or let's let's just make a number and say five percent, maximum ten percent of kids on college campuses, and then there's a bunch of followers who join. Yeah, okay, hey, the kids, you know, <laughs> I remember being a, a foolish kid, teenager, and that's what they really are. So I think that there is a combination of ignorance, meaning being unaware. Number two, of envy of seeing these people, they're everywhere. Like we have in, in this week's section of the Torah reading of the Bible, you know, the Jews are everywhere in the land, right? You can't not look around, see Jewish names and such like that for good or the opposite. Uh, so you're right that we have, it's, it's never been better. Never been better. There's always been golden ages in every land that we lived in. Uh, but the United States is a welcoming country simply because this country was built upon ideals. And one of the great ideals is freedom of religion, the Bill of Rights. So what I'd like to ask you to speak about now is the downside of being, let's say, visibly Jewish right now. 
you mentioned something wonderful, standing online and a, an, a religious Christian coming and welcoming you and blessing you. Because she understands that the Bible says those who bless the Jews will be blessed and those who curse the Jews will be cursed. Well, hello, I like to be amongst the blessed ones. So she blesses you because that's their world. In America today, we have fewer religious Christians. And I think that does, that does not bode well for either America or the Jewish people. So I'm asking you to speak about that. Yes. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, in on the college campuses, as I said, and even in streets like in Los Angeles and New York, there have been incidents of people attacking Jews, beating beating on Jews. Um, and you mentioned this aspect of America moving away from being a religious society, which is unfortunately true in this generation. Uh, a rabbi was asked back in the 1910s or 1920s um, when they were living in Russia, a lot of Jews were living in Russia um, before the Tsar, uh, during the period of the Tsar, before the communists, uh, whether to move to the United States. He had an opportunity to move to the United States and he asked the rabbi, you know, it's a land of the free, etc. And the rabbi said, it is better. And I don't know that I agree with that rabbi's opinion at the time, but the rabbi felt it is better to stay here living under persecution under the czar in a country that is religious, where Christians are religious, than to move to the United States where you will be physically safer and have more freedoms, but your children and grandchildren will disappear as Jews in a country where religion is not as powerful as it is here in Russia, he said, your children and grandchildren will be gone. Here in Russia will be persecuted, but your children and grandchildren will know they're Jewish and remain Jewish. In the United States, amid the assimilation and the lack of religion, we see a lot of Jewish people giving up their Jewishness, their Judaism. Uh, they don't cherish the unique gift they were given the heritage that their parents gave them. I find it extremely unusual and fascinating that many Jewish young people give up their religious heritage while at the same time I'm approached by non-Jewish people, not as many, but I'm approached by non-Jewish people who want to convert to Judaism. And I ask, why do you want to be Jewish? And they talk about, they've read about the Jewish heritage and they want that for themselves and for their families and their children. They'd like to become part of the Jewish people. And so, Rabbi, how do I convert? And we talk about it. And they get into a conversion program. And, and the irony that you have people from outside wanting to come in and to become part of a people. And I say, but we face persecution. We face anti-Semitism. I know, Rabbi, but there are other parts of Judaism that, of it, make it worthwhile to me. And so they want so much to accept and take upon themselves and to, and become part of that heritage. And then on the other hand, see Jewish people who are born with it. This gift was simply handed down by their parents when they were born, and they don't value it or cherish it. A very, very strange phenomenon. It's a phenomenon, it's a dilemma, and don't go away because we have more of this wonderful, amazing Rabbi Doe Fisher on the other side of this break, and we have sponsors that love us. We urge you to uh, patronize them. We wouldn't have them on if we didn't believe in them, and so we'll be right back on this brief message with wonderful Rabbi Doe Fisher. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, everybody. You know me, Barry Shore, and you know my story. Standing up in the morning, able to leave tall buildings in a single bound that night, being in the hospital, totally, completely paralyzed. Talk about a change of life. I was faced with lots of issues, difficulties, paths forward, if there was to be one. And I'm here to tell you that finding advice from professional people makes all the difference certainly in my life. And I would urge everybody to consider 
doing so in your life. And if you've ever had the opportunity to find someone or some two people that are really matched up with you, then you know it makes a difference. I urge you to consider using better help. Better help, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online, so it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill in a brief questionnaire, I've done it, to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. This is your opportunity to make a difference and become the best you possible. Let therapy be your map with better help. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash joy of living today and get 10% off your first month. That's better help. H E L P dot com forward slash joy of living better help h e l p dot com forward slash joy of living best wishes bye now good day beautiful bounce with beloved immortal beings and good looking people maybe you're good looking so always looking for and finding the good we found good in abundance our cup runneth over with good his name is Rabbi Dole Fisher. He is a remarkably eclectic, accomplished, wonderful being who is the point of the spear of Jewish thought and activity, in certainly in California and throughout the United States of America. And in addition to that, he's a very successful practicing attorney. Again, we call him basic Jewish overachievers. And we were just discussing how it is that people who have the heritage, they have the treasure in their hands and somehow let it slip through, and others who are now seeking it out because they recognize that being Jewish is a benefit in life, and not just life, but in for your children and your children's children, generation to generation. That's actually the genius of the Jew. It is not for the immediate moment. We are what's called the eternal people. Now, let's go and talk about a very touchy, difficult, interesting situation. And one of the essays I read that you uh, penned recently, uh, Rabbi Fisher, which is that you've been inoculated against anti-Semitism. And um, the, the rising up of bitterness and anger and literal hatred from a, a number of groups, mostly younger people, who have been bitten with the anti-Semitism, how should we call it, virus, that raises its ugly head every so often, is now out there in the world. And you see it throughout the United States of America, and it's taking on very virulent forms again, and it's been expressed, of course, in slaughter in Israel on October 7th, on a great Jewish holiday. Slaughter. And rape and pillaging on a level that shocks anybody who was paying attention, except for the ones who celebrated. So I need you, please, to speak to our vast audience. How does this compute? How is it possible for someone to even think that they are celebrating such villainy? The study of uh, 2,000 years of Jewish exile has brought to, for those of us who've studied it deeply, there has been so much anti-Semitism. And by the way, I'm not a victim, and I don't think of myself as a victim. And Jews must not ever walk around so deeply obsessed by anti-Semitism that they walk around feeling they want to be added to the list of victims. We're not victims. We succeed, and that's my sense. I'm a success. I'm not a victim, even in the face of anti-Semitism. But we have faced so much anti-Semitism in the last 2,000 years that I have said I'm inoculated to it. It's like after you've had a certain cold, a certain virus, your body develops antibodies so that it can fight off the virus the next time it shows up. That's how Inoculations work when you go and you get all these immunizations. They give you a little bit of that illness, a little bit of that virus or whatever, 
It allows your body to develop antibodies to it and fight it off. I have been exposed to so much anti-Semitism that it's created antibodies. I shrug it off. As long as they keep their hands off me, I don't care what they say. If I'm walking, I've had a situation where, you know, we Orthodox Jews, we don't thrive on the Sabbath. So on Shabbat, as I'm walking home from synagogue, I have about a 30-minute walk. I'm about a mile and a half I live from my synagogue. So it's a 30-minute walk. It's good and healthy. And once or twice a year, because I have a yarmulke, I'll be walking, minding my own business, maybe even having a conversation. Some car shoots by in the street, and they yell out the window something about Jews, something hot, hostile and hateful about Jews. And I'll hear it once or twice a year. Sometimes I'll see another person with me get all upset. My attitude is I'm inoculated. I've heard this enough times, doesn't shock me. Now, when I heard on October 7, after, first of all, being Orthodox, I did not listen to the news or can't use any electronics or electricity on a day like Shabbat, Saturday. On top of it, it's Shemini Atzeret. As you said, it's one of our holier days. And uh, the end of the, it was actually uh, the end of the Jewish holy season. It started with Rosh Hashanah, then Yom Kippur, Sukkot, etc., into Shemini Atzeret, Simchat Torah. Or in Israel, it's just uh, Shemini Atzer. And we hear that in one day, truly animals, not even human beings, came into Israel, crossed the border, and they slaughtered. They slaughtered 1,200 human beings in one day, most such anti-Jewish murders in one day since Hitler and the, and the Holocaust. They, they went to, and, and they, they actually started with people who are peaceniks, who actually are the ones who most want Israel to give up land even, because they trust that the Hamas, they trusted the people in Gaza. Oh, these people, they're good people. Many of those who got slaughtered live in southern Israel, lived in southern Israel in kibbutzim, kibbutzes, where they had Arab workers working in their homes for years as members, practically members of the family. And they had no idea that these people from Gaza <clears throat> who came into their homes and for years were practically part of their family and were being paid by them at wages far higher than anything they could have earned, those people could have earned in Gaza. It turns out those workers were making notes. Who's in which room? How many people in this home? What are their names? Did it have any dogs? Where did the dog stay? And they provided all this information to, God, to, to Hamas so that on October 7, when Hamas invaded with a certain number of so-called civilians in Gaza, they knew exactly where to go, which rooms to go, and they murdered, they, they did, they murdered in ways that are unspeakable in our universe. Um, not only did they stab people to death, um, they beheaded, they first, they went murdering babies. In one kibbutz, they murdered 40 babies. They beheaded the babies, took off the heads, decapitated them. In Jewish law, when someone dies, he or she is buried. And if, God forbid, they, um, they have to be buried whole. Uh, if, God forbid, they uh, lost an arm. If possible, their arm has to be buried with the rest of them. If there was, let's say, a car accident, God forbid, they lost an arm in a car accident. In Jewish law, we don't just bury most of the body, but we bury with that arm. In fact, if there's blood, at the scene of the accident, they gathered, if it's moist enough that it can be recovered, they take they take cloths and they gather all the blood and they put the cloths in the in the burial site, also in the grave site, in the coffin. So here you want to bury these babies properly, and you have 40 dead babies and 40 heads all over the place, and you have to figure out which 
head goes with which baby. And there actually are rabbis and volunteers who had to figure that out. They cut out the heads of babies. There was cases where they saw pregnant women and they cut the fetus out of the woman while she's alive and then stabbed the fetus to death and stabbed the mother to death. There are people that they took and put into ovens. They took babies and put into ovens while they were alive. And they burned them alive in an oven. So these are things that are, they didn't just kill people. They tortured in ways that even Hitler did not. Even the German Nazis who put Jews into ovens did it after they were dead. First, they went to the extra step of first murdering the Jews in the gas chambers, and then they put them in ovens. But even the German Nazis didn't put the Jews straight into ovens. So what happened on October 7 is unspeakable, and it brought home to the people of Israel that there's no, there's no peace with them. There's no negotiating with them long term. You can make a quick deal. We'll stop fighting for a month, for a week to get hostages. But there's no more permanent peace with them. Such people are not humans and they must be destroyed. And since they're hiding underneath tunnels and they hide among innocent and often not innocent, they hide among civilians and they use them as human shields. They basically put their weapons in residential apartment buildings, daring Israel to bomb the building, which is the only way they can catch the terrorist. So they dare Israel. They put their weapons in schools, in hospitals, in mosques. They dare Israel go and here's where all our weapons and rocket launchers, grenades, rifles. It's all here, right here, the IEDs the improvised explosive devices in the mosque. We're storing them in a mosque. We dare you to blow up the mosque. We've, sco- we've got them in the school. We so let me, let me pause for a moment. I want to unpack a few things here because it's, it's riveting and horrific. I'm going to make a few general statements and then I'm going to make a difficult statement. The general statement, so let's go back. Jews are not victims. We don't think of ourselves that way. We don't want to be that way. Because if you once you succumb to be thinking that you're a victim, you can't live in the world. You'll always be pushed down. We are victors, not victims. We have live through the biblical experience of a relationship with God, and that is what enables us to rise above. Now, is it easy? No! (laughs) Hello! You listen to what Rabbi Fisher just talked about. What we must do and what we are doing is concentrating our effort to defeat a heinous enemy. First, you have to understand that there's an enemy. If you don't understand that, you can't beat it. So you have to know that you're dealing with what we call two-legged beings posing as human. And you and we must eradicate the evil. To turn a blind eye and say, well, we, we just will do the best we can, it's not going to work. This is a moment, a pivotal moment in Jewish history, in Western civilization, in the world where evil must be confronted and defeated. Again, I'm saying this, you don't have to think, Rabbi, I'm not putting words in Rabbi Fisher's mouth. By the way, it's very important to understand everything you want to know about Rabbi Fisher, and there's so much, there's so much, and it's all good. Just go to my website, barryshore.com, barryshore.com, and everything is there. It's just, it's so empowering of who he is and what he's doing, and, and we're so happy that he's here with us today. I want to go back to something else that you mentioned because it's indicative of the experience of the Jew wherever we live. So you mentioned walking home from the synagogue, and every once in a while there's an epithet hurled. We don't mind epithets that are hurled. We mind rocks that are hurled or bombs and things like that. Epithets we can handle. But there's a great rabbinic figure who just passed away recently, a few years ago, named Rabbi Avigdor Miller. May his name be for a blessing. And I learned something from him decades ago. And he learned it from a, a wonderful Jew named Montefiore, uh, Moses Montefiore. 
And the, uh, the idea of, let's say, walking along in, in New York on Eastern Parkway where he lived and somebody yelling out an epithet, he would stop and say, oh, ho, ho, thank you. You recognize me. I'm a Jew. That's who we are. We are beloved of God. Now, some people say, what are you talking about? That's chosen people's stuff. Yes, hello. We've been chosen to be what we'll call, for want of a better term, that point of contact, that lighthouse, that beaming lighthouse that President Ronald Reagan used to speak about the United States. Because the United States is based on biblical principles. We want to be a light unto the world. That is our role as Jews. And I think you might agree with me on this, Robbie Fisher. I, I know you will. Uh, we only have a few more minutes before we go to a break. And just in this, in the couple of minutes, I want to mention two things. Number one, we talk about our podcast, which is called The Joy of Living. Not The Joy of Living. The Joy of Living. Joy is a fabulous acronym that stands for Journey of You. Because that's what joy is all about. That is the essence of the Jew. Jews are literally marinated in joy because we know it's a journey and we love the journey because we're not here just for ourselves. We're part of a continuum. People who came before us, people who come after us because that's who we are. We are an eternal people. And I'm going to ask Rabbi Fisher to speak about what he calls the two-state solution is the final solution when we come back right after this break. Okay, Rabbi Fisher? So we'll be right back after this break. There's more Rabbi Fisher on the other side. Don't go away. What if you could shop at your favorite local stores, swipe your current credit card, and get extra cashback rewards? And what if you could also have donations sent to your favorite cause at no extra cost to you? What if this amazing program was absolutely free and very simple to set up? Well, what if is here. Welcome to Einstein Cares, where your everyday shopping gives you and your favorite cause extra money. It's fast, it's easy, and effortless. Good day, beautiful, bountiful, beloved, immortal beings, and good-looking people. Remember, you're good-looking. So I was looking for and finding the good. We found good in abundance. His name is Rabbi Dole Fisher. He is a font of wisdom. Everything you want to know about him, maybe even, yeah, everything and more is go to my website, barryshore.com, B-A-R-R-Y-S-H-O-R-E. Go there. It's all there. And again, we urge everybody always share this podcast with five people. I didn't say 50 or 100. You want to do that, it's up to you. But at least five, so we can touch a million and a half people. It's really important for you to spread the word because everything we talk about, especially today from Robert Fisher, is truth and it's important and it's, it's vital to get this out into the world. So Robert Fisher, what do you mean that a two-state solution is the final solution? Hey, isn't that what everybody wants? It's so fascinating that People talk about things that they actually don't know about. It's sort of like the way if you're from New York or California, you really you don't know where Iowa is. And, you know, it's somewhere in the middle of America. And if you ask the average person in New York or California, what state is adjacent to Iowa? And it's, it is more than one. They would not know. Maybe they guess, I don't know, Kansas, Nebraska because they would think farmland, but they wouldn't know. Maybe, who knows, maybe Minnesota, North Carolina, who knows? And the same way people talk about Israel and the Middle East, they don't know what's going on. They don't know all the facts. They just hear somebody else say, you know, it would be a good idea if Israel would just engage in a two-state solution and give over Judea, Samaria, uh, the biblical heartland, west of the Jordan River, uh, to be an Arab country, and then everybody will have peace. And that's just the opposite of what would happen. First of all, in uh, northern Israel, which is which borders Syria and Lebanon, there was a period Israel was in a security belt area of southern Lebanon. The Israeli army preserved the security area of southern Lebanon to keep the terrorists 
farther away from Israel's northern border. And Prime Minister Ehud Barak said, you know what, we could have complete peace with Lebanon if we just pull the troops out. We don't even have to make a deal. We don't even have to say, in return for pulling the troops out, you promise something. Just let's pull the troops out and let them be, let the people in Lebanon be, and we'll have peace. And instead, what happened is that terrorists filled the gap, Hezbollah, and now Israel has a nightmare on its north, northern border that probably is going to lead to a full-scale war within the year, um, fighting with Nasrallah in Hezbollah. Then in the south in 2005, Ariel Sharon said, you know, we have troops in Gaza. You want peace? We should just pull everybody out. We don't have to make deals. We don't have to say, we'll only pull our troops out if you agree. Let's just pull everybody out. Let them have their country. Let them be. So Israel just pulled out its troops in 2005, gave them, left them with a beautiful place, and immediately Hamas came in, took over the place, and turned it into a nightmare, a terrorist state. Not just Hamas is not just a terrorist group. It's a terrorist state. It's a whole terrorist country. If Israel were to give up the land in Judea Samaria that now is called Palestine Authority, and if they would agree to let that be its own country, a so-called Palestinian state, Israel would have a third front to have to deal with. Not only would they have bombs and rockets being shot every day from the south in Hamas and Gaza, and from the north, Hezbollah and Lebanon, but they would have it coming at them from al Fatah and the east, it would be coming at them. Israel would have, everybody in Israel would have to live underground. The whole place would have so many rockets flying from every direction that the Israelis wouldn't be able to live anymore. So now we go back a step. Okay, I understand why for security, Israel cannot let that be a country. But beyond that, there are now 850,000 Jews living in what they call the West Bank, that is Eastern Jerusalem and Judea, the rest of Judea, Samaria. 850,000, it's like a million Jews. So Mahmoud Abbas, who Israelis know as Abu Mazen by his terrorist name, has said he won't allow any Jews to live in the country if he gets a Palestine. All right, so you're saying that Israel's got to remove a million Jews and resettle them. You can't do it. It's logistically impossible. Back in 2005, I mentioned how Israel walked out of Gaza. When Israel left Gaza, they also evacuated 8,500 Jews who were living there. There were Jews living in Gaza, in Gush Katif, other places. 8,500 Jews. Israel found in evacuating those 8,500 Jews, bringing them back into Israel, Israel was practically unable to find them jobs, to find them houses. It was too much. In a small country the size of New Jersey, with a population the size of New York City, to go ahead and try to suddenly find 10,000 jobs and 10,000 homes of 10,000 people and school for the children of 10,000 families, they found it practically impossible. So now you're telling Israel that they should give up territory, which is going to mean they have to relocate 100 times as many people. Instead of 8,500, 850,000, they're going to have to take 100 times as many people, find 100 times as many jobs, 100 times as many houses, and they couldn't do it for the 8,500. So that's the second reason it's impossible. And I don't want to just keep going on, but there are so many reasons to buy. Third of all, Israel has every right to that land. Israel, in before when, when Britain was given the Palestine mandate after World War I, that included everything that today is the country of Jordan, plus everything west of the Jordan River. And there was a two-state solution. Britain decided we'll make peace. And the peace we're going to make is we're going to give the Arabs 78% of Palestine. And so the Arabs were given everything east of the Jordan River. And the Jews initially were given everything west of the Jordan River. And then the Arabs decided 
instead of calling their land Palestine, they gave it a different name. They called it Transjordan. And it was a long name, so they changed it. They shortened it later to Jordan. And the Jews were given west of Jordan, west of the Jordan River. And initially, that was called Palestine. Back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, Jews in America donated to help financially the Jews living in Palestine. West of the Jordan was just known as Palestine, which now is Israel. And Jews gave to the United Palestine Fund, the United Palestine Appeal. The Jewish newspaper in Israel in those days was known as the Palestine Post. It was Palestine, Palestine, Jews of the Palestinians. And then later when the country was created, they changed the name from Palestine, but the Jews were the Palestinians. They changed the name from Palestine to Israel, the way other countries changed their names. For example, Rhodesia changed their name. It used to be called Rhodesia. Now it's called Zimbabwe. There are many countries, uh, Siam, if anybody goes to see the musical, The King and I, The King of Siam, now it's called Thailand. Many countries, many cities change their names. New Amsterdam became New York. I can go on and on. I could list a hundred of them. So Israel is Palestine. And the notion that, number one, you're going to give up the security and create a third military front in light of what happened in the north with Hezbollah and the south with, with Hamas, that you're going to give that over on the east. Number two, how are you going to move a million people and find them jobs? And number three, you have a right to that land anyway. It's your land. Um, for all those reasons, it's impossible to have a so-called two-state solution where Israel would give up the so-called West Bank, what we call Judea Samaria. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. Everyone talks about it. Everyone says, well, maybe it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Let's hope and pray that what you say is true because if it did happen it would be the end of this remarkable wonderful amazing prolific beneficial positive pleasant place called Eretz Yisrael the country of Israel which is one of the most dynamic places in the entire world because it's populated by people who are impossible to hold down. Just to, we'll, we'll finish up with a couple of other nice data points that you've helped me understand over the years, and it's, it's, it's really it's a lot of fun. Um, here you have a country, let's say, let's just pick a number. It's, it's less than 10 million people, the total, and that's not just Jews. It, it, people who live in Israel are Jews, Arabs, uh, Druze, Muslims, uh, Christians, uh, people from Ethiopia, people all over the world. It is truly one of the most eclectic countries in the world outside the United States, maybe even as uh, eclectic as the United States of America. It is a truly dynamic place. Now, if you contrast that with the surrounding countries, uh, all the way from Morocco on the far, I guess that is uh, east, all the way through to Iran, all those countries in between, including Turkey, are all Arab, not, not Arab, they're all Muslim countries. Seven, 20, 22 Muslim countries with hundreds and hundreds of millions of Muslims. They don't produce in three decades the number of books that Israel produces in two years. <laughs> they don't produce the number of inventions in 70 years that Israel produced. But again, part of this goes back to what we said earlier about people on college campus say, it's called envy. People are envious of success. We are a people that is blessed. And it, it, are we smarter than other people? Yes. Are we more perseverant than other people? Yes. And I think it's the perseverance coupled with that, that ability to utilize our God-given talents that is unique to Judaism that creates an environment that other people find so attractive. Yes, there's envy in the world, and that, I think, drives a lot. 
but that's uh, not going to happen. I, I love and I'm very happy, and I, I think our listening audience very happy that you've mentioned data points, factual aspects, and saying it's not going to happen. And to think it should happen is a death knell, not just for Israel. It would be the death knell for what is pe- what is called the Middle East, even, and certainly for Western civilization, which, by the way, is one of the tenets of the bad people. The bad people do not like Western civilization. That's, and they admit it. The good news is they admit it. The bad news is that the blind people in the West who are so filled with success that they, they can't even fathom and understand where it came from, and therefore they're willing to learn other things. Well, I'm, I'm, all, I'm sorry to say these words, wonderful Rabbi Dole Fisher, that we've come to a conclusion of our time. We have three questions for you. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you three quick questions. You ready for these questions? Number one, will you come back again? God willing. Okay. He's willing. Would you be willing? Sure. Thank you. Number two, you have 80 seconds to answer this question. What is your most fervent desire? Hmm. My most fervent desire is that my wife join me in making Aliyah, in moving to Israel. I currently live in California. I had plans with my previous wife to move to Israel, my wife, Ellen of blessed memory. Tragically, she died at a younger age uh, from cancer three years ago. And I was blessed to find a sweet, darling new wife. And my dream ultimately, more than anything, is that the plan to move to Israel, which was so fervent that Ellen and I shared, that uh, we'd be able to do that. See, the only thing holding Ellen and me back was that we did not want to leave America as long as her father was still alive, because he needed her. And that was our agreement, as long as dad is still alive. And dad lived to be 100 years old. (laughs) So so, So that was that, he outlived Ellen. Okay, number three. I'm going to give you a hug in front of 376,819 people around the world. Are you ready? Let me tell you what HUG stands for. HUG stands for Heartfelt Unlimited Giving. Heartfelt Unlimited Giving. One, two, three. You're listening to The Joy of Living with your humble host, Barry Shore, and our fabulous guest, Rabbi Dole Fisher. And remember, on this show, we work with the three fundamentals of life, and these 21 fundamentals of life will enable you to be happier, healthier, and wealthier. They are, number one, your life has purpose. When you leave a purpose driven life, you go mad. Number two, you mad stands for make a difference. And number three is to unlock the power and the secrets of everyday words and terms, such as WWW, what a wonderful world, smile, seeing miracles in life every day, or as my eight-year-old niece says, seeing miracles in everyday life. Learn to create the kind of world you want to live in, causing rethinking, enabling all to excel. That means a shift in perspective. Keep that F in place. Shift in perspective and utilize, internalize, and leverage the six most important words you'll ever learn. And they are choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Learn to use four-letter words. Love, life, hope, free, gift, play, pray, swim. And tell the world when you see your friends and family after the show, Barry Shaw wants to teach the world to F you, capital N, capital N. That will give you a hook and a reason to talk about what did Rabbi Fisher have to talk about? Wow, listen to this. And you can tell them all the things that we discussed today. And I urge everybody, use the two most powerful words in the English language three times a day from now the rest of your life, and you will make a life that's more happy, healthier, and wealthier. And these two words are... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stan, for to harmonize and nurture kindness. And on that wonderful note, fabulous, wonderful Rabbi Dole Fisher, we're going to give a blessing to everybody. That blessing is go forth, live exuberantly, 
spread the seeds of joy, happiness, peace, and love. Go mad. Go make a difference. Don't go. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Joy of Living podcast. Now that's another step towards your healthier, happier, and wealthier life. Never hesitate to do good in the world, no matter what the situation. Join us for another upbeat discussion next time at BarryShore.com. And be sure to leave a rating and subscribe to the show to get more conversations like this. And remember to share it with your family and friends too. See you on the next episode.